Hi, everybody. Come on in. Make yourself at home. It's so nice to see you all. Isn't it nice, even after the forum, that we can still get together? It doesn't have to be a whole year in between when we see each other, even if it's virtually. But it was nice to see you all, um, a lot of you in San Diego. So thanks again to those who were able to come and I got to shake your hand in person. So this is um, the 12th meeting of SEATS Local Energy Resources Network. What does that mean? It's our birthday. So happy birthday, everybody. Um, this has been one of my favorite things that I get to do in my work is to get together with all of you and help everybody just do what we can to get the resources we need to pursue our energy and climate goals on the ground here in California. Um, and so we are very excited today. We're joined by Leah Lewis Prescott, and she is with Rocky Mountain Institute. She's going to share with us the Equitable Home Electrification Toolkit. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Before that, we are going to go through our agenda. And like usual, we're going to go through a bunch of opportunities. If you think I normally share a lot today, just buckle your seatbelts, I guess, because I got a lot um, to share with you. Um, and let's do introductions too. So if you are able to throw your introduction in the chat, just tell us briefly who you are, where you're from. Um, if you want to turn your webcam on, we always like that. I'm Angie Hacker. I'm the statewide best practices coordinator for the California Climate and Energy Collaborative. This is a space that we come back to every month for about an hour where we brief you on everything we know of all the resources that are timely and coming uh, that can help you, per, you know, pursue all of your energy and climate goals. So we're glad you're here with us. Once I'm done with some opportunities, we'll hear from Leah with RMI, and then we have a few program updates for you at the end. All right, let's dive in now. Uh, apologies in advance again for, for this, but if some of you were with me for a couple special sessions of the forum, you realize I kind of had a different approach to presenting opportunities, and I decided I liked it. What this is doing is kind of giving us the anatomy of how a grant is born, how a funding opportunity is born. So this is showing us, these three columns are showing us that policy is driving investment. So we talk about policy here a lot, things like the budget, cap and trade auction revenue and California legislation, regulatory processes, it's driving investments. When those investments happen, they go to specific agencies at the state or federal level, and those agencies are directed to design assistance programs and go and look for our feedback, feedback from the public and various stakeholders. And that's who, that could be a year or more in that process where it's being designed. And eventually it becomes an actual solicitation that we can all go out and apply for. And I'm bringing it to you in this way because I kind of just, maybe I want to see it, you to see how my brain works, but really it just it's just how the funding opportunities work. And our phase one goal here at SEEK has been to help you prepare for those solicitations and know they're coming in advance and at least know they're coming at all. That was sort of phase one. We're doing a pretty good, good job at that now. Second phase is that middle, that middle one, that middle column, where we wanna also make sure you're aware that you have the opportunity to inform these funding opportunities before they hit the streets. And that's a really powerful position to be in if you have the time and energy to do it we're helping you do that by informing you that they, these input opportunities exist. Right now, there's actually six of them. That's overwhelming, and we know it's overwhelming. So in some cases, we're trying to help you compile that input or just bring the agencies here so you can provide input live and get it done really seamlessly and streamlined. You know, it's an efficient way to, to comment, sometimes informally. Um, and then a little bit, phase three being hey, if we can actually influence policy, then we're going to be really in a good driver's seat. So that's where we're like to go. And we've touched our toes a little bit into things like the California Energy Commission's IPER process, uh, the Integrated Energy Policy Report, and the CARP scoping plan, right? So we've been trying to get involved in influencing or informing those processes. So that's why it's set up this way. We're first going to go through some state opportunities, then we're going to go through federal and then other. So not every opportunity is coming from federal or state. Um, but, you know, we've been talking about all of these policies for a while. Um, but just know, and I guess the big point here is billions of dollars have been invested here in California, either through the budget or cap and trade and then other legislation, for example. 
since I think we last met, SB 852 is legislation that's going to provide the opportunity for local government to have local governments to have climate resilience financing districts. I mean, all these things are just important. They become really important when they turn into a program you could actually take advantage of. Um, so I tried to narrow down to the things that are in red, have something that's active, either an input opportunity or a solicitation, or green, something that's coming in the near term. Okay, so down here, um, I'm gonna go through what agencies are offering. And this is by far not a full scope of what agencies ever offer. It's just sort of relevant stuff right now. So the California Energy Commission has quite a few opportunities that are gonna be coming. Um, first one I wanna mention is a Community Energy Resilience Investment Program. So this was, uh, there was actually legislation related to this program that didn't need to get passed because the California Energy Commission got uh, infrastructure law dollars to develop this, this program anyway. So they didn't need legislation. So now there's $170 million over five years. It's something to keep on your radar. There's nothing to do yet, but it's basically helping um, it invest in projects across California that increase community energy resilience and reliability, promote decarbonization. Uh, there was a kickoff webinar in August, but they're in, basically in design mode now. Prepare yourself for some listening sessions that are probably going to be coming. You could probably help inform this process, um, and they are expecting a NOFA to come out in 2023. So if you're in energy resilience mode, keep your eye out for that. It's a, a big one. Um, I basically, when I scan for things, I'm looking for stuff that's climate action, clean energy, energy efficiency, energy resilience. Um, the other ones that we've been talking about. Hmm, actually, this slide looks old. John, I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, but anyways, there are some other programs I want to tell you about. So there's the Building Initiative for Low Emissions Development, the BUILD program. We've been talking about this one. It's just something that's continuously available for now. This is a program that is for um, it's incentives for low income residential development. So if that's something that you're involved in or you know people that are in your community, you can pass, um, pass this along. It's an incentive program that's available now on an ongoing basis, as far as we know. We've also talked to you a little bit about the California Automated Permit Processing Program, CalApp. There's $20 million that's been allocated for this program, and it really is you know, something to pass along to your building departments or if you're the ones in charge of it, um, to automate solar permit processing. That one is going to be due um, I have it here in May, so you'll have till May. Yep, May 1st, 2023. So this one has a long application window. Um, so California Public Utilities Commission has a couple of things that have been open. So there's the microgrid incentive program, which allocated $200 million in 2021 to the process of helping support microgrid uh, development. Um, what I'm hearing is that mo that money is not really reaching communities, local governments. It's mainly going towards the utilities supporting what they need to do on the interconnection and the, the process behind microgrids, but just know that it exists and you're starting to see IOUs like pg e developing programs like their community microgrid enablement program, which is available now for folks in the pg e territory. Um, they also, the the CPC also has the SGIP program, self-generation incentive program. That's been out a while and a lot of that's been absorbed, but I heard just at the forum that it got refunded big time. Um, and so we will be seeing additional incentives, um, I think mainly on storage, and there are still some storage, energy storage rebates available now. Um, depending on what IRD territory you're in, you can go and look at what tier they're on. So that's CPUC, California, um, California's Office of Planning and Research, OPR. They have some opportunities. These ones are, um, are pretty great. So yeah, these, this is an old slide, but that's okay. We'll get you the more recent version. Uh, let's see here. So two things I want to really point out to you. One is the Adaptation Planning Grant. So the Adaptation Planning Grant from OPR is going to have $10 million in round one. This is a brand new program at the state level, and it's going to provide funding to help the local, regional, and tribal planning needs, provide communi uh, communities with resources to identify climate resilience priorities. So what's interesting, I just sat through a webinar, and we're going to have these guys come and speak to us in November. So stay tuned 
Um, there's some good stuff in here, even outside of sort of traditional adaptation. So while you would want, well, if you're doing a, a comprehensive adaptation plan, this would also help you support climate action. So on the, on the mitigation side, it could also help support climate action planning. That's big because we don't have any other place to support that. Um, so that's really something to keep an eye out for. And there are plenty in here for folks trying to tackle energy resilience. So what I wanted to point out to you is this is one of those big input opportunities that's in front of us right now. Um, there's a workshop, uh, I think, actually for unincorporated and rural communities happening on the 13th of this month. Uh, it says 11th. I think that's meant to be 13th. And then comments are due on the 28th. So there's actually a comment period on these guidelines. Um, due on October 28th, and then we'll have a learn presentation on this program to get into more details on November 8th. Um, and then there's another program that's sort of the sister or cousin of that program. It's getting designed around the same time, Regional Resilience Planning and Implementation Grant. I think that one is a little further behind the Adaptation Planning Grant, but it's it's related. We'll keep you posted on that. There's no nothing to do there right now, just to know that it exists. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so I wanted to make sure a few other agencies in California are on your radar. We always talk about what's happening at the Strategic Growth Council. Um, so the Transformative Climate Communities Program, you know, round four ended a few months back, the solicitation for that. But smartly, I really have to, I always give credit. Um, where credit is due, Strategic Growth Council said, oh, this is a complicated project. We're going to offer TA way ahead of round five so that people can help can get prepared to decide whether or not this is something they're going to um, they're going to participate and get all the partners and all the technical stuff together that they need. So TA is available starting now, um, and the solicitation itself for this program is going to be in early 2023. So if you think this program is something you might be interested in, it supports community resilience projects such as trans sustainable and affordable housing, public transit stations, bike and pedestrian improvements, urban greening. Um, at sort of a, a neighborhood or community scale, um, then that might be a program that you want to be tracking. And just there's a web, there's a link here um, that will make sure it gets to you that is specifically to apply for TA now to get that help. Um, another big one is the community resilience centers. If, you know, this is more on the resilience side, but if you're in that world and you're tracking um, this new program, there were guidelines um, that are going to be released in fall. So there'll be an input opportunity sort of dropping any second. And this community resilience center program is designed really as like a, a, for physical centers, getting physical centers ready so that there's a, a place for the community to go and to use when resilience um, is necessary. So that's a program that is actually really well funded in a couple of from a couple of different policies and there will be $25 million for round one. And they're expecting that NOFA to be released sometime in 2023. But of course, first they have to go through the guideline process. Okay. Strategic Growth Council also has some movement on the next round of the affordable housing and sustainable communities program. Um, that program is designed to make it easier for Californians to drive less by making sure housing jobs and key destinations are accessible by walking, biking, and transit. Um, so there is going to be a workshop in October and comments for around seven guidelines. Um, actually, there's a bunch of workshops in October, so I didn't post them all. There's a, a website with all of the workshops um, that you'll have an opportunity to provide input at the workshop, or if you want to submit comments, you would have to do that by October 31st. So another comment. So if you want to duplicate your DNA and just be like a comment writer, then now would be the time. <laughs> um, those applications for the next round of affordable housing, sustainable communities are expected in January 2023. So that's not far, especially with the holidays. All of this, to me, if I were back on the inside, would mean I would be figuring out who my grant writers are internally or externally, getting getting prepared. Okay, here's another one. Oh, from California. This is actually from, let me see here. California Clean Mobility Options Voucher Program. Now I'm blanking on the agency. I think it's, 
I'll have to go look. So it's $1 million available here. Uh, and it's voucher program applications are going to open on November 2nd. This is eligible for lots of different entities. And the idea, including, I think, CBOs and NGOs, the idea is to do a transportation as, uh, needs assessment for your community. And then California Office of Emergency Services. These aren't ones that we always look for, right? Do you all track? Cal OES for programs. I wanted to mention here, there's one called the Building Resilience Infrastructure and Communities Program. It's BRIC, it's actually a FEMA program. It's been well-funded by a lot of the federal policies. Uh, and so there, uh, what happens though, you don't actually apply directly as a sub-applicant to FEMA, you apply through Cal OES. And so um, you can apply through Cal OES by December 2nd. And uh, yeah, the notice of intent was due by September 16th. So it's something to look into, especially for major resilient energy resilience projects. Those are something that could qualify. So if you're looking for a funding source for some of those, um, I believe the uh, requirement there is to also have a hazard mitigation plan in place prior to being um, an applicant, which probably a lot of you do, but this is something to coordinate with your emergency services department on. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is mainly to say there's a lot coming down from the federal government, as you might be uh, suspecting, especially with the infrastructure bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, and then, you know, the Biden administration, their budgets have uh, stuck. So they put a lot of money into climate change in uh, the federal budget. So a lot of it's coming from the DOE. And most of it, there's nothing to do right now, just to know it's coming. There are all these different programs coming. Last month, we talked about EECBG. Um, we, I haven't heard anything new about, you know, formula allocations being announced or when to propose. I'll let you know when I do. But just know all this green over here, just by the end of this year or maybe early next year, I think a lot of these are going to drop. Holy Toledo, there's going to be a lot from the DOE. But the other one where there is something to, well, actually one from the DOE, there's something to do. There's an input opportunity with something called the Grid Resilience and Innovation Partnership uh, Program. And it's $10.5 billion from the infrastructure bill for three little sub programs. And I just want to mention here, if you're somebody who really um, has an interest in the grid reliability space, grid resilience space, or grid innovation space, they're looking for comments on their guidelines through an RFI that's going to be due in a few days. Okay. But the big one that I thought that was super interesting on the federal front in terms of an input opportunity is actually from the US IRS and Treasury. So, um, get to my notes here. There's too much for me to memorize. All right. So, here's a fun fact of the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Acts. $369 billion investment in addressing climate change, $270 billion is going to be delivered through tax incentives. Okay. Some of those are clean energy tax incentives. So this um, agency is has put out a notice for comments on the clean energy tax incentives that are coming out of the IRA. Um, so obviously those are going to be built mainly for your constituents to take advantage of, but you have an opportunity to comment here by uh, November 4th on six different types of clean energy incentives. So there's energy generation incentives, credit enhancements, incentives for homes and buildings, consumer vehicle credits, manufacturing credits, and credit monetization. I imagine folks here might have an interest in especially the incentives for home homes and buildings and energy generation incentives. Just wanted to make sure you knew there's an opportunity there. I actually reached out. If I get super lucky, I might actually be able to hook somebody from the IRS or Treasury to come speak uh, to us because they're offering local roundtables, and I'd like to get one for us here in California. So if I if I get a meeting, I'll let you all know. If I can bring them to learn, I will. Otherwise, there might be a separate meeting so we can provide input. All right, so that's Fed. And last one here, last, uh, next slide. I mean, it's not all about the state and federal government. That's a lot of where the resources are, but don't forget. I mean, we obviously have um, our RENs, our regional energy networks, three of them active now, IREN coming on board, another one in development, um, serving rural RENs, excited about all of that. 
And um, just making sure you folks know that if you're in a REN area, you probably have access to programs like code support, um, either code compliance with Title 24 or developing reach codes, um, and also support with things like engineering or estimates or um, technical support on public agency retrofits. And they also, of course, provide things like residential and commercial incentives and support. In addition to other stuff like workforce development, this is not a complete list. But just know if you're in those communities, always look to your RENs to see what kinds of opportunities they're offering, either for you as a public agency or for your constituents. CCAs, there's a link here we're going to be providing. This is to um, CCAs Resilience Initiatives. This is just sharing where a lot of the CCAs are really stepping in to provide things like incentives for energy storage um, and other incentives too, sometimes for EV, sometimes for refrigerate, refrigerants. Um, also, putting on your radar a event coming up on October 18th. This is to provide, um, this is a DOE webinar with our friends at Stop Waste Berkeley and Gainesville. Uh, that's cities of Berkeley and Gainesville. And they're going to showcase um, transparency to residents and incentives uh, and, to, and, and incentivize energy efficiency with home energy scores. So these are jurisdictions that have experience with the DOE's home energy score program, and they're going to talk about um, their experiences. Um, also mentioning here, pg and &E and Pros our friends at Prospect SV are offering something called a market access program. Um, this is a financial incentive program for commercial building energy efficiency projects in the pg and &E territory. The idea is to reduce peak energy demand. It's available to through 2023. And they say these incentives can be much bigger than what you might find in traditional EE programs. Um, also mentioning that the Building Decarbonization Coalition, our friends over there, have just released something called a Zero Emission Building Ordinance Tracker. So if you just want to see who's doing zero emission building ordinances around the country and kind of track how many, um, that link will take you there. And it's, it's pretty interesting. They have some cool visualizations, too. And then finally, our segue to our speaker today, uh, Rocky Mountain Institute and Emerald Cities Collaborative have published recently something called an equitable home electrification toolkit that I wanted to make sure gets into your hands because I know a lot of you are thinking about how to make home electrification equitable. And with that, I'm going to ask us to go to our next slide. I'm going to introduce our speaker. All right, so we are super happy. Uh, and by the way, thank you to anybody who's been posting in the chat other opportunities that you want local governments like and their partners like you to be aware of, feel free to drop stuff in the chat so we know, we all know uh, what's, what's coming. So thank you and thanks for withstanding the fire hose. All right, Leah Lewis Prescott is a manager with Carbon Free Buildings team at the Rocky Mountain Institute where she works to eliminate fossil fuel use in buildings. Um, so she is here today and she's gonna be talking to us about that um, equitable home electrification toolkit. We're really pleased that she could make it today. Uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Leah. Thanks again for coming. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here with this group. Um, thank you all for your time and your interest in the equitable home electrification toolkit. Uh, so this toolkit was developed in partnership between RMI and Emerald Cities Collaborative. So if you're not familiar with RMI, we are an independent nonprofit that is working to transform global energy systems and secure a zero carbon future for all. Emerald Cities Collaborative is a national nonprofit of, of a national nonprofit network of organizations um, working to advance a sustainable environment while creating just and inclusive economies for all. So this was a great partnership. I th I'd say RMI brought a lot of technical expertise and Emerald Cities Collaborative um, really brought community engagement expertise and a, a deeper equity lens to create this toolkit. Um, next slide, please. So I'll give you a little bit of background on what the toolkit is, um, why you might want to use it, and how we developed it, um, but spend most of the time here actually diving into some of the tools in the toolkit to help orient you to um, some of the things in there and how you can start to use them. Um, a quick quick end on takeaways, and then we'll open to Q&A. Um, I welcome folks to drop questions in the chat as we go as well. Next slide. Thank you. Great. So what is the toolkit? Um, this online toolkit is really a process guide with a set of tools to help communities 
advance equitable electrification of their existing housing stock. Um, so we're talking about swapping fossil fuel appliances in homes with clean electric alternatives. So think furnace, water heater, cooktop, dryer, um, maybe some other appliances, right? This toolkit was specifically designed for local policymakers, local governments to partner with frontline communities from the onset and co-develop policy solutions. So that it's really a process that centers around community engagement and co-ownership um, to deliver both equitable processes and equitable policy outcomes. Um, it is not limited that to those two audiences. I think there's a lot of value in um, broader partnerships and collaboration around equitable home electrification, but just to give you a sense of um, the target audience that we had in mind in developing this. Um, and the ultimate purpose that we hope you'll use the toolkit for is uh, to help communities develop an equitable home electrification policy roadmap that has been informed and driven by community input. So when we say roadmap, we simply mean a plan for how we'll electrify local homes um, in your jurisdiction. Uh, we really view this policy roadmap as step one. Um, so it's not like a fully fleshed out binding plan with all the policies you're gonna pass in 20 years. Um, it's really more of just the community starting to lay out ideas and get pen to paper on a starting point to guide your next steps in advancing local electrification of homes. Um, so again, even though this was developed for local governments and community partners, I think everybody in this room has a role to play in contributing to these local roadmaps and advancing equitable electrification. So hopefully you can all find value in the toolkit. Um, the last thing on this slide is just we did limit the scope to existing home electrification for a couple reasons. Um, mainly existing buildings are a huge pollution source that we must address. Building electrification is widely acknowledged as a way to achieve our climate goals and a necessary pathway to decarbonization. Um, and by focusing on solutions for existing homes, it's a unique opportunity to tackle a number of challenges at once. So not only electrifying appliances, but how can we also address housing affordability, for example? Um, so that's the lens with which we develop the toolkit. Next slide, please. Okay, so how did we make it? Um, it really started with RMI engaging with the city of Berkeley as they developed their local policy roadmap, the existing building electrification strategy. Um, we recognized a lot of interest from other municipalities to kind of mimic what Berkeley did and develop their own roadmaps. And so we sought to help uh, other municipalities do this as well. Um, we did it through what RMI calls the local government cohort model, which just means we convene a group of local government representatives in a series of workshops to pursue a common end goal. In this case, the goal was to develop or start to develop an equitable home electrification policy roadmap. So RMI partnered with Emerald Cities Collaborative to co-develop and co-lead this cohort. Uh, we did require that participating municipalities partner with a community organization and RMI and its funders compensated those CBOs for their time. So what we had was a cohort of 10 teams of local governments and community orgs that partnered in a series of workshops over a span of nine months with the goal of advancing toward developing an equitable home electrification policy roadmap. Um, we did only have uh, California municipalities and CBOs, um, but we did uh, broaden the toolkit so that the tools in the toolkit can be used beyond California. But we, you'll hear today, we have some California specific resources for this group. Um, so through this process, RMI and Emerald Cities developed and were able to refine a lot of the resources in this toolkit with these groups. Next slide, please. Okay, before we look at the toolkit, I have to focus on and, and just call out that equity is not optional here. We very intentionally added that to the name and the center of the cohort because building electrification in our eyes must happen equitably. This means that policymakers need to be collaborating with frontline communities from the get-go to develop solutions together with those communities that will prioritize their needs. 
So in our eyes, an equitable approach will include both broadening the range of voices engaged in policymaking. So who else can you partner with that maybe isn't normally involved in this process? And also deepening those voices influence. So you're not just bringing a policy idea to communities for sign off, but rather you're working with these communities to develop those ideas. Um, ultimately, we believe this will deliver the most equitable outcomes while also enabling a more equitable process. So a lot of wins here if you're successful. Um, bottom line is this toolkit is really focused on equitable climate solutions, which we believe are the only climate solutions. So with that, let's move into the toolkit itself. Um, and thank you uh, to my facilitator team for sharing the link to the toolkit here. Just wanted to share a quick snapshot of the web page. Um, the link should already be in the chat. Uh, we can jump to the next slide. Um, so we organize the toolkit around four process steps that communities can follow to develop their roadmap. These four steps are necessarily iterative. So it's not a one, two, three, four, but like they're all gonna be happening probably in tandem. Um, the first and foremost step is engage your community. This is gonna be the most iterative. We hope you're doing this throughout the process. Um, also establish your team, complete preliminary research, and finally draft your roadmap. So when you visit the web page, you'll see each of these steps reflected in the table of contents. We have that snapshot on the right. Um, each has its own page, its own resources that you can click through, um, and you can see we also have a content library with additional reports and resources from other organizations that we think could be useful in this endeavor. Uh, so for the remainder of the slides, I'll highlight different resources that you can find in the toolkit, um, and I, I'll, I tried to put in the top right uh, the location of where you can find each resource. You'll notice it's there. They're not necessarily in a perfect order, but um, I'm gonna walk you through, I think, an order that is useful for how you can kind of get started and, and the process steps you can take. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so to get started, I would recommend you take a look at the process guide and roadmap template. That's all one document. You'll find it in draft your roadmap. Um, which is likely your last step. But I think that this is a really great place to start because it provides two resources up front. The first is the process guide of how to create the roadmap. And the second is the roadmap template that shows you what a roadmap might look like, what it might include. Um, in the process guide, you can see at the top that those are the same four steps that we use to organize the toolkit. But if you look at this process guide, you can understand each step in much greater detail. And I think it's a good way to help orient you to the rest of the toolkit. What are we talking about when we say establish your team? Then you can also preview the roadmap template to give you a sense of what you're driving toward. Admittedly, we were reluctant to create a template at all because we think that these roadmaps should be highly individualized based on community input and, and what your teams and community groups are advocating for. Um, but we did decide to produce this based on feedback from participants. And we figure that at least you have you know, somewhere to start. You can just tear this apart and redesign it completely with your community as you go. Um, so that is a, a good starting place. Uh, next slide, please. Another early step to consider is stakeholder mapping. Um, we have provided a stakeholder mapping tool, which is just a spreadsheet to help you organize all of the different uh, stakeholders that can and should be involved in the process of equitable home electrification. So who are they? What do they care about? What concerns might they have? How could they be involved in the process? Um, this is a tool that you can revisit and refine over time, uh, especially as you progress in your engagement efforts. Next, next slide, please. Okay, the spectrum of community engagement. This is not something that RMI or Emerald Cities developed. Um, it lives in the content library, and it is it was created by Rosa Gonzalez and Facilitating Power. But we referenced it a lot in our cohort because it provides a highly useful framework for defining what community engagement means and looks like in practice. So if you look at this graphic, it's showing a spectrum of levels of engagement ranging from completely ignore on the left, which is what we don't want, 
to defer to and collaborate with on the right, which is what we hope that groups are striving toward in their engagement efforts. This is how we framed our expectations for the teams of local governments and CBOs in our cohort. We said, we want you to be on the collaborate and defer to side of the spectrum. So um, we really encourage folks to take a look at this tool and consider maybe how might you have to revise your usual processes to strive to actually achieve more of the collaborate and defer to um, engagement with the community groups that you're working with. So I offer this, this um, tool as, as a frame of mind before you begin community engagement work. Next slide, please. Okay, this is this ecosystem mapping guide is something we created for municipalities, but might be useful to others as they start to think about engaging community orgs in different different work. Um, as you're establishing your team of folks and thinking about what community groups to partner with, this is a way to help identify um, who might be a good fit, what community organizations might be a good fit. Uh, we, our rationale here was that a lot of local governments are already working with community groups, but they are often not the groups that are representing the frontline communities. And we really want those folks to be engaged in the policymaking process. So People's Climate Innovation Center helped Emerald Cities and RMI create this tool that uses seven indicators to help identify which community orgs could be a good fit for a long-term partnership on equitable home electrification. You can see them here. Are they aligned with this work in some way? Are they local and BIPOC-led? Are they trusted by and connected to the community? Are they effective? And do they have the capacity to collaborate today and in the long-term? Um, so this is how we helped our uh, municipalities select their CBO partners. Next slide, please. Um, so if you do use that ecosystem mapping guide, you find a really good community org, it's possible that they've never worked on electrification before. And in fact, some of the CBOs in our cohort had not, and that's okay. Um, so one of the tools that we developed is this FAQ for community leaders that essentially serves as an electrification 101 guide to help these orgs understand the topic and, and be prepared to engage more on the technical um, electrification nuances. So hopefully this is a useful kind of one-on-one -on -one doc for other folks as well. Next slide, please. Okay, another part of establishing your team is securing funding for this work, especially if we're engaging frontline communities who are less well-resourced, it's going to be really important to make sure that they are compensated for their time and engagement. One tool that could be useful is this full tool. It's called Federal Funding for Local Decarbonization. And it's an online tool that aims to consolidate the many federal funding sources available into one simple um, kind of spreadsheet with different filters. And you can kind of sort through and figure out what funding opportunities are a good fit for your needs. Um, this is a living resource. It gets updated every quarter. So hopefully this is something that you and your community can keep coming back to throughout your work. Next slide, please. Okay, so after you've engaged your team, you're probably going to want to start completing preliminary research that can help you prepare to think about um, electrifying homes. One important piece of this is understanding your local building stock. Um, so RMI used a tool called Urban Footprint to help develop custom building inventories for our participating cities. So information like what, what types of buildings are there, what um, appliance fuel do they use, some of the equity information um, around the buildings. Uh, unfortunately, we're not able to do this for every municipality, but we do have guidance and samples that you can look through on the online toolkit, and we're happy to offer more information to folks on the process if they want to dive in. But the important thing here is just find a way to understand your existing building stock so that you can better cater your solutions to fit your community's building's needs. Next slide, please. Okay, RMI also developed a cost analysis tool for California. So this one is California specific. It's available upon request. So please feel free to email me if you'd like, like to take a look. Um, but this just uses a lot of data from E3's 2019 report called Residential Building Electrification in California. 
Uh, we updated some of the inputs and ultimately it's a spreadsheet to pr produce uh, electrification cost estimates at the household level in different climate zones by different building types. Um, so it just gives you a sense of that household cost. So again, if, you, if you'd like to take a look here, just feel free to email me um, after the presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, we also put together a roadmap action menu that summarizes the building electrification solutions that other municipalities have included in their published roadmaps. So basically just giving you a sense of what other communities are doing or thinking about doing so that you don't have to completely reinvent the wheel. Uh, we looked at, I think, six different municipality roadmaps, and we pulled together all of their proposed solutions into one spreadsheet with our own subjective categorization to help you kind of filter. So like who's doing something on workforce development, you can kind of filter and, and see what comes up. Um, as you explore this, you'll notice that a lot of these so-called actions are um, maybe commitments to explore potential policies. Uh, they're not necessarily often actual policies or programs yet. So again, like this is just another reminder that these roadmaps are a little bit more of like planning for the plan, so to speak. Kind of the first step. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so once you're ready to roll up your sleeves, you've got a group of um, stakeholders engaged, you want to work on this process, um, we really encourage you to utilize the community collaboration workbook. This is probably one of the most valuable resources we created in this toolkit. It is 16 different exercises that communities can do together with partners to guide the community con to guide the conversation and help inform your ultimate roadmap. Um, in the cohort, the teams completed these exercises in breakout rooms, and we were able to use their feedback on the exercises to refine them for this final pro product. Um, you can download the whole workbook, you can download individual exercises, totally up to you. But you'll see, for instance, that stakeholder mapping tool that I shared earlier, there's a whole exercise designed around doing that stakeholder engagement mapping exercise with other partners as a group and like working through that together. Um, so just an example. Uh, next slide, I'll show you one more example of an exercise in the workbook. Um, this one, the equity principles one, I think is really important to call out. It links to the exercise, the workbook exercise links to this guidance document where we've created a how to guidance doc for how to develop equity principles or a set of guiding principles or requirements that any future policy proposal must be designed to meet in order to address key community members' concerns. So in other words, what principles will you abide by to make sure that the policies you enact are benefiting community members and not causing further harm? This is a highly iterative process of community engagement, but we think it's a really essential component of an equitable roadmap that I really wanted to make sure to call out and highlight. Um, it also contains concrete examples from communities that have been through this process, uh, Berkeley and San Jose specifically. Um, and we did work with the Building Electrification Institute, BEI, to develop this um, because they were so deeply involved in the process with San Jose. So I um, just wanted to call out that partnership. Next slide, please. All right, so one more quick slide on takeaways before Q&A. Um, if you forget everything else I shared, I want to leave you with these last takeaways. Next slide. Okay, first and foremost, walk before you run. Again, these, these roadmaps are step one. Um, you, you don't need to have your full plan. You're, you're starting with the plan for the plan, but it's important to get started on this process and to do it with communities. Also, the toolkit was designed to help achieve both equitable processes and equitable outcomes. So to ensure equitable processes, put in the work up front to engage a diverse set of partners and uh, community groups and bring them into the development policy development process. Um, to ensure equitable outcomes, invest time in the iterative process of developing those equi equity principles and use those principles to design future policy solutions. 
Um, the other thing that I hope is really clear is that partnerships produce progress. Partnerships are so key. And that means that you should be investing in your partners, both your time and your money. Um, time is not free. If you want to work with community groups that are not well resourced, please, please compensate them for their time. Uh, also, identifying the right partners and building relationships with those partners will take time. So be ready to invest your time and resources in the development of that um, those partnerships. It is worth the extra time and money up front to really invest in community engagement and yield the best outcomes for your community. And finally, this is a rapidly evolving space. Uh, the housing electrification landscape is evolving in real time around us. And also we need to be starting this work right now. So even while some pieces are getting figured out and um, federal and state and, and local efforts are complementing the work that you're getting started, it's still important to start planning at the local level, um, even if everything's not perfectly set around you yet. Um, okay, that's all I've got for you today. Um, thank you again for your time and for listening. Um, this is a shout out slide to the, the team members, Ryan and Michael at RMI and Avni and Neha at Emerald Cities. Um, and with that, I would love to open the floor to questions. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, totally fantastic and totally in line with a lot of the messages and that we heard a lot of the themes that came out of the SEEK forum this month or last month. So I think um, I think a lot of folks are going to take advantage of what you've got here. And I just want to say thank you because there's some of us sitting on the outside of, of agencies, of, of municipalities that are trying to do whatever we can to take the burden off of doing this work. And so I feel like, wow, they've really nailed it on how to get through this process and taking taking off the burden of whatever they can. So thank you for that. And I also want to say thank you for the F-Fold site. That's pretty cool. I'm going to use that. I did not know about it. So thank you. Um, I'm going to start with a question from Rising Sun. Uh, they are asking, does the cost analysis tool take into account different costs of labor? Or what is the assumed labor in the cost analysis? Example, prevailing wage or market rate? Oh, thank you. I love that question. Um, I have to be honest with you. It's been some time since I've been in that tool and I'm not I can't recall off the top of my head what we're using for labor, but I will I will say that the tool is designed so that there's like there's a user input version uh, option or like some base baseline options that we have put in there. So I think there's even if even if we have a labor rate that um you have better information for there's there's an opportunity in the tool and using the tool to put in your own numbers as well so that's kind of baked in there because we don't expect to have had the most perfect information especially when we think about the local level and we know that these numbers are always changing in time so um yeah i, I actually would welcome if uh if and when you reach out i can share the tool with you and if you have recommendations for us to update those baseline numbers even uh, we're really open to that. So apologies that I don't have that off the top of my head, but let's let's touch base offline. So yeah, Leah, let me know that she's totally open to feedback and more questions. She's going to drop her email address um, in the chat here if anybody wants to follow up with her on uh, for any of that. I see another question here from Nick Freeman. Um, so he is saying great process articulation, Leah. Fold is a great resource. Um, regarding building inventory, is there a link to the urban footprint database? So the urban footprint is a subscription database. So it's possible, you know, it's basically you'd have to pay to, to use urban footprint. I think it's an open tool once you do pay, but um we I can share the link if helpful to where we have some of the resources on the toolkit for um, kind of walking you through what we did on Urban Footprint. If anybody here has Urban Footprint, though, um, we have like a how to guide on how we used Urban Footprint to produce um, these building inventories. Um, so yeah, let's let let me go pull the link there and share it in the chat. Um, but also feel free to follow up with me if you have additional questions there, because we really do want to help that other um, municipalities replicate that process. 
Um, I don't see other questions from folks in the chat, but I was wondering just, you know, from your insights, having looked across all of these communities doing this work, where do you see the communities trip up the most? Uh, <laughs> um, I think not, not taking, not taking enough time or committing enough time to the iterative community engagement process. Um, I think it's like there's this eagerness and this urgency around building electrification. And sometimes there are even, uh, you know, local climate action plans with set dates. And there's there's this pressure to do this thing by this time. But I just think we can do a lot more if we invest up front the time and effort to engage the right folks and community members um, and really start to think about policies with them, even if it takes us longer to get to the policy. Like you have so much more buy in if you've done this with your communities. You're probably avoiding a lot of potential pitfalls that might come when you enact a policy without having consulted your communities. So I just, I just see. Um, the upfront time investment being really valuable and meaningful. And I think it's it's often easy to um, kind of check a box and not do the level of community engagement that we've learned is really necessary to do this work right. Yeah, thank you for that. I just dropped an um, uh, example from the city of San Francisco that I saw this week. I threw it in the LinkedIn group as well. That they did a RFP to try to get CBOs on board. I thought that was cool. So I just think we're seeing some innovative things happening in California to try to do this better. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Leah, uh, for all of that. And for folks that are uh, writing to me and asking if we're going to get all the materials today, you totally are. So you're going to get a breakdown of all the resources we talked about. You'll get the recording, you'll get the slides, you'll get it all. So don't stress. Um, let's see. I think there might be one more question here. Oh, so yeah, we'll, we'll take these last two. Uh, Nick's asking, is there a California resource for energy savings measures for heat, uh, HWHP um, and heat pump incentives? Yeah, I would direct you to um, switcheson.org if you if you haven't seen that. Um, there's You can go on the top right. There's a whole incentive tracker. Um, I think you can kind of like select heat pump water heater and put in your zip code and it shows you like all the slew of incentives um, for, for heat pump water heaters and heat pumps in your region. So really awesome resource there. We should have them come speak probably too. Thank you. And then Alice Sung is asking, she's saying thanks so much for emphasizing real community-led engagement. Is there funding for this for communities? We hope so. I think that's the key thing is making sure, you know, especially if it's um, a local government asking to partner with community groups, we are emphasizing the need to fund those groups. Um, and so I'll share the link to the F-Fold tool. That's one place you can look for funding. Um, I think there's probably there's probably a lot of opportunities locally, especially here in California, but I think it's just worth putting in the time to make sure that you can get that funding and then help bring in the right groups and, and that they're um, compensated for their time. So yeah, thanks for asking that, Alice. Um, if folks have other ideas of resources where um, that like funding opportunities are consolidated that we can add to the toolkit, please don't hesitate to reach out and share those with me. Yeah, and I'll just add stuff coming out from OPR and Strategic Growth Council is almost always in emphasizing and encouraging, you know, real community engagement. And so even just the regional climate collaboratives that just closed on October 7th did a lot to encourage that. That's going to set up the structures to do this on an ongoing basis. So if you, if you weren't part of an application, your region may end up with an RCC, you're going to want to tap into that and hopefully help, help them do that in a really good way. All right. Leah, that was so wonderful. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us. Um, and thanks everybody for the good questions. We just have a couple more things to share with you before we close out today. And uh, maybe we can get those slides back up. I know John's gonna set us up with a couple of program updates before I close us out. So John Vandevoort from the SEEK team, go for it, John. Thank you so much, Angie. Yeah, just a couple of quick updates for folks. I wanna say, once more, thank you to everyone who was able to join us for the SEEK Forum down in San Diego last month, just a couple of weeks ago. It was great to meet everyone in person for the first time. Um, if you were not able to join us or if there were 
um, some resources from some certain sessions you were hoping to revisit. We have made um, a lot of the resources from the form available in our um, website, in our uh, resource library. Um, through the links that were just dropped in the chat, you can find both the uh, full resource library as well as specifically the resources for from the 2022 SEEK Forum. Then one last thing, I want to just say thanks to everyone for their continued participation in this network. We've been doing this for a, one full year now. Once again, happy birthday to us. We've certainly fallen into a, a rhythm and we think that we're doing a pretty good job of being responsive to folks' needs, but we want to be flexible and make sure that you know the services that we're providing remain responsive to what everyone is hoping to get out of these sessions. And we are on our one year anniversary, our birthday, looking for um, some feedback from folks. So folks could take just a couple of minutes, you know, probably around five, maximum 10 minutes to fill out the um, survey that I just dropped in the chat would be really, really appreciated just to make sure that, you know, we're continuing to incorporate all of your feedback as we continue to plan these sessions. So thanks so much for everyone's participation. That was everything from me. And I'll hand it back to you to close us out. Right. Yep. And feel free to be constructive. You can say, Angie, you talk too much. You're just blowing my mind. Too much stuff. <laughs> we just want to make sure we get this right. And actually, even in that survey, if you have suggestions for specific content that you'd like to see, you can send it through there or you could send it directly to me anytime. We would take it if, you, if there's something you want to learn more about. All right, our next meeting is going to be November 8th. Like I said, we're going to have um, OPR. They're going to be here specifically to talk mostly about that adaptation planning grant. Yes, seek we're not totally adaptation, but like I said, there's going to be some good stuff for climate action and energy resilience in that grant. So we're going to talk about it. Um, and then just to give you a heads up on December, we already have folks booked to give us a sort of a year end policy wrap up. So our Roger Dickinson, he is uh, Civic Wells Policy Director. He's going to come and talk about legislative updates. Uh, Stephen over with Local Government Sustainable Energy Coalition is going to be providing a regulatory update mainly on CPUC. So stay tuned for those two meetings. We're excited. Um, this network continues to grow. So feel free to share this invitation with others. And Come see us again next month. Thanks for being here. We're going to give you two minutes of your life back. All right. Take care, everybody.